Hello there, and welcome to Innovators in Care. I'm your host, Ruben Bush, and this is the show where we sit down with thought leaders in health and social care to talk about the problems they're solving and how they are innovating to reduce system-wide pressure and improve patient outcomes. In episode three, we sat down with Jamie Frame and talks about treating patients at home, how primary care networks provide a single point of access, and the Fools project he is working on to get PCNs responding to Fools. Now today, we move on to home care. We're sitting down with Mark McGlade, owner of Home Instead Extra in East Devon. Mark has run this franchise since 2011 and built it up to be outstanding in all five areas of the CQC ratings. In this episode, we dive into what Mark is working on to improve home care for care professionals, the care system as a whole, and most of all, for the client. Enjoy. Hello, Mark. Welcome to Innovate in Care. Hi, Ruben. Pleasure to be here. Very good. Very good. Um, I wonder if we could start, Mark, with if you give us a bit of an introduction to yourself, who you are, um, what roles you've had in the past, and... And, and your sort of history up to now, your story yeah, up to now. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, my name's Mark McGlade, and I'm the managing director and co-owner of Home Instead, Exeter and East Devon, uh, co-owner with my wife, Vanessa, uh, who's also a director here at uh, Home Instead. Um, yeah, a little bit of our background. We've, we've been operating here for, this is our 12th year now. We started Home Instead in 2011. Um, but neither of us had worked in care before. Yes, okay. I don't think you know, you, you need to have come from a background of working in care to know what good quality care looks like. Um, but we'd, we'd had a vision very much to, to have a, uh, a home care company that was very, very different from experiences that we'd seen and heard of and experienced uh, previously. You know, Vanessa had experienced what it was like looking for home care for her grandmother here in East Devon. And um, it wasn't good. A lot of the home care was typically very short visits, different people coming in all the time. And when we were trying to find that for her grandmother, so we, we both, both said that when we set up home instead, we'd have a very different experience for that. My personal background is that uh, no, I hadn't worked in, in care. Um, I, I, when I, I went to university uh, from school and then uh, I joined the Royal Navy. I was a Royal Navy officer. Uh, I used to do a bit of flying and helicopters and uh, also on ships as well. Uh, met Vanessa when I was at, uh, at, at Dartmouth, the Royal Naval uh, College in, 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 here in Devon. Um, but then when I came out of the Royal Navy, uh, I worked in in the aerospace and defense sector, went to live in America, worked uh, very closely with the US Department of Defense. Um, and we were there for 14 years. So I've got two children, Sophie and James, both born over in the States. We had a great time in America. Uh, but then when I left, uh, we came back to the UK uh, with two younger children, finished off their education here. And um, I was still working in very much in the defense and security sector, but flying all over the world. Um, and we um, then made a decision when kids would go off, off to university that we'd always like to work together and come back to, and bring uh, home, uh, home, home instead to Devon. So that's what kind of brought, brought us down here about 12 years ago. But um, I think my background in working in defense and aerospace and also sort of the business sort of sector had really enabled me to work very much with things like total quality management, particularly in, as you can imagine in the defense and aerospace sector where quality is very, very important. And that was what one of the guiding principles behind, uh, I think my journey, even with Home Instead, is to bring a lot more of those total quality management uh, processes to, to the care sector. And that's been a very interesting journey the last 12 years. Yes, no, that, that sounds fascinating, that's good. I think next would be really good if you could give us a little explainer in terms of what Home Instead is, what it does, um, and then also your particular branch of Home Instead. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Home Instead, uh, as the name kind of indicates there, it's, it, it's, it's about allowing people to remain in their own home instead of going into a care home. Hence, we are a, a home care provider, so we uh, allow and enable 
primarily older people, to remain independently living in their own home. But Homestead has actually got a very, very different ethos. It's not a typical home, home care provider. Um, Homestead actually started about 30 years ago in the United States uh, by a couple, uh, Paul and Laurie Hogan, who had a very different concept of how home care could be personalized. Um, and they brought up, uh, they developed this model, it caught on. So many people liked the concept out of it. They franchised the model. And uh, Home Instead actually now operates in 13 countries worldwide. Came to the UK about 16, 17 years ago. And um, we now have about 240 locations across the UK. Now, what makes Home Instead very, very different? Well, when you consider that the average time of a home care visit in the UK is 18 minutes, and 75% of all home care is 30 minutes or less a visit. That's the time that's often allocated for a carer to turn up to a frail elderly person and get them up, out of bed, wash, bath, shower, dressed and breakfast. So can you imagine what that experience is like in 18 minutes? Um, it's not good for the client, it's not good for, for the carer. At home instead, very, very different ethos. Our whole mission is to be, well our mission is to be not only the care provider of choice, but the care employer of choice. So as part of that, if we are personalizing care with care that's good enough for our own mum or dad, then we don't do these short visits. No visit is less than one hour at home instead. That's the minimum we provide. So that's uh, the fundamental, um, fundamental difference. The other differences are that we don't wear uniforms. None of the home instead employees wear a uniform. We don't go into our clients dressed as like looking like nurses. Um, and which we find that can actually be a barrier. You're telling that frail elderly person that they need care, so a nurse has turned up, or someone looking like a nurse has turned up. Whereas we will carefully match all of our clients with our care professionals based around their interests, their hobbies, their life experiences, so that they form trusted relationships. So at the heart of Home Instead's care philosophy is that we have relationship-led care for a minimum of one hour. And that could be everything. So the kind of support that we provide is everything from companionship, could be home help, taking someone down to the local garden center, down to a cafe or for, for a drink out for lunch. And when we're walking down the high street with our clients, they're out with a friend, they're out with a, a family member. Nobody needs to know that they're out with a carer. The other big difference is that, yeah, we changed the, the, the title. We used to call our, our uh, um, uh, what, what people may refer to as carers, but we, uh, the Home Instead title had always been caregivers. But about 18 months ago or so, we changed that uh, title in order to professionalize care. All of our uh, uh, staff are known as care professionals. So we have a very big mission to professionalize the whole care sector, very much at the forefront of training, learning, development, and recognition uh, of all of our staff. Yes, okay, that's very good. Um, and we talked about it before, You've, um, Falls has been a part of, of what you've been doing. Could you say a bit more about that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, I think going, this goes back a few years now. So if we go back to sort of 2017, 2018, that sort of time frame. Uh, I remember that we, we, we were approached um, uh, at, here at Home Instead by the uh, Southwest Ambulance Service and the Care Quality Commission because um, they wanted to see if we could get involved in providing some kind of training to our staff to help reduce the number of call-outs that the ambulances were going out to visit uh, for older people that may have had a fall at home. Now, this initially was a, was a bit of a, a, an alarm bell for me because you know we're not trained, we're not, we don't provide um, health and, and, and medical services and not trained as nurses and doctors. So to go out and help somebody who may have had a fall, then you've got to assess that person whether they're actually injured or not. Uh, so what was going through my head initially was all the insurance liability claims and all these sorts of things out there. 
Um, but I remember that you know, we sat down with uh, Laura, our, uh, who was our registered manager at the time, and she's now general manager, and Vanessa, my wife, and we thought this through, and if, if, that if we could get the appropriate training and work with Southwest Ambulance Service, and this was with the backing of the Care Quality Commission as well, then surely we must be able to come up with a way that we can mitigate those risks and help support not only our, our clients who may have had a fall, but also alleviate the pressures on the ambulance service. So we went through the training. We developed uh, a protocol with the ambulance service and, and, and applied the, the same traffic light principles, the red, amber, greens that the, the ambulance service and paramedics would go through to assess whether somebody is injured or not injured. And we adapted that to the, uh, the care sector for our staff. And we came up with a, um, a really workable solution such that our um, team could, could actually go out if somebody had a fall and assess whether they were injured or not. And obviously if, if they weren't injured and we went through this uh, process, then we had no reason to call the ambulance. We could actually just then get them back up onto their feet again um, and, and save a lot of money, time and angst, if you like, for, for, for our clients in, 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 instead of going to hospital. Now at that point in say 2017, we had already been assessed um, and inspected by the Care Quality Commission. We were actually the first home care provider in the southwest of England to be rated outstanding by the CQC, which I'm really something I'm, we're really really proud of, for my whole team for for, for that level of uh, level of commitment in keeping all of our clients safe. Um, and the, the way they go above and beyond in, in, in caring. So at this point, we had great processes in place to be able to manage a project like this. When we were then subsequently reinspected by the Care Quality Commission in 2018, after we'd been involved in, in this program, um, we had a lot of statistical evidence to be able to show that the, 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 the amount of reductions that we had in frail people that had a fall from going to hospital. So we were monitoring from a, a total quality management perspective those clients that had had a fall and we would end up calling to go uh, an ambulance out and would go to hospital compared to those who we were able to support and not go to hospital. Um, now two issues there, one is going through the protocol which is can you assess whether they've had a fall or had an injury or not an injury. And the next question is, well, if they haven't had an injury, how do you get them back up onto their feet again? Um, and a lot, of the, a lot of the technology or aids out there require two people. Um, we were really looking for something that would, could be done as a, um, a single person operation as well. Um, we actually went to, uh, uh, approached uh, Fell Games. We got a razor chair. And that razor chair combined with the protocols that we had developed and we were using enabled us to go from a 57% hospitalization rate that we were experienced before we entered into this project down to a 10% hospitalization rate. Now, when you consider that the average cost of uh, um, the average cost to the taxpayer and the NHS of hospitalization from a fall the average cost is £5,000. And in that first year of operation that we went into using the razor chair with our falls protocol, we prevented over 92 hospitalizations. So that was a net savings of over £400,000 to the taxpayer and to the NHS just in our Exeter and East Devon. And we've been using it very successfully every year since then and making considerable sort of improvements in the, in the protocol and the way we use that as well. That's good, that's good. We're very passionate about work in the community um, around falls awareness and falls prevention. Could you say a bit about that? Yes, absolutely, Ruben. We um, certainly at Home Instead, and uh, it's a big passion of ours locally, is that where we have, uh, if we've got any, uh, any, any experience or best practice, we like to share that with, uh, with others, whether it's other care providers, but also to taking some of those tips and techniques, if you like, back out into the community, the wider community. Um, obviously, some of the things that we have been involved in with things like the razor chair is all about what happens after somebody's had a fall and preventing them going to hospital. Um, but we soon learned that if we could actually um, prevent people from falling in the first instance through greater awareness 
of what are the reasons why people will have a fall, might have a fall, then that would be helping everybody. So we've very much engaged uh, in recent years in taking community talks out there to older people's homes, into, into community centres, um, and whether it's with the, the Women's Institute and so on as well, and we give lots of talks in the community about the main reasons why people might have a fall. It could, could be through um, uh, taking multiple medications, it's footwear, it's um, get, getting up in the middle of the night, maybe to go to, go to the bathroom and so on, trips, trip hazards pointing out some of these different reasons and uh, highlighting how to maybe how to prevent or reduce the uh, reduce the uh, impact of having a fall as well absolutely that's good very good thanks mark um i think it'd be good to talk next about covid um i think it was a very challenging time for well for all of the health and social care sector um but very interesting your your outlook on that from a from a home care point of view? Yeah, well, I think COVID, I think it was a game changer for, for all of us. I think, um, you know, in that uh, end of March, a uh, couple of years ago, wasn't it, 2020, it was, it was going into that, that period where none of us knew what we were going into. Um, to be honest with you, when we went into that first lockdown, um, the way we could see things happening in Italy and around the rest of around the world, we didn't even know whether we'd have a business in six months. It was that, you know, we didn't know what we're going into. No, it was the blind leading the blind. So I think our biggest single issue, first of all, in, the, in those very early days was well, two, two things. One, where did we get PPE from? All the PPE was being channeled to the NHS. So gloves, aprons, masks. We, we, one, we were never used to using a mask uh, up until that point. So now it's mandated you have to have masks and you've got to wear gloves and aprons. You couldn't get gloves, aprons or masks for love and the money. And in fact, at the end of the day, for a mask that was typically costing about 10, 12p each, we ended up having to, to buy them. We, we were getting from, from China, we were contacting distributors over there, but they were costing like five pounds each. So um, very, very quickly, I think we were racking up tens of thousands of pounds in PPE costs if you could get it. Um, by, by the skin of our teeth, we, we, we managed n never to run out. And, th and then it was only after a few months that we could start getting um, uh, resources from, from the NHS. But initially, Homestead obviously banded together across the country where we could do bulk buys and so on as well. Um, and uh, that, that, that proved very, very useful. I think the, the second major change for us was in technology. Um, having people working from home meant that very, very quickly the whole care sector had to adopt to things like a new, this new technology called Zoom and uh, technologies like Teams where you do remote working. Uh, fortunately, I think certainly Home Instead, we had already made uh, the, the investment into um, uh, going going digital anyway, so we, everybody had computers, everybody had laptops, um, and then it was just getting things like Zoom on board so that we could very, very quickly, so we, it was really in a matter of just a couple of days, people could work from home. Um, and we soon adapted to that way of, that, that way of working uh, and, and bringing, bringing teams in. I'd, I'd say that we already had a plan um, to look at uh, obviously going going fully digital, but what COVID did was probably accelerate those plans. Yes. Um, whereas we may have had a plan to to, to get there within uh, two years, we probably did it within two months. So we think the vaccine was fast, but I think uh, it, which it was in the terms of that development. But right across the care sector, I think it brought people into the digital age much much quicker. So much so that. Um, I think we are, we're very, very ahead of that curve, I think, in terms of innovation, in that our office, certainly Home Estate Extra in East Devon, we are not only what we would say is fully digital, we are completely paperless as well. So all of our operations is run digitally, even our training, there's not a scrap of paper to be seen, everything is done, is done in, in, in the digital world now. 
That's good, good. Um, and you must have noticed some changes in um, your clients, how they they thought and um, mm. what they their sort of outlook in terms of people coming into their home. It must have been quite a challenge. Very challenging. I think wearing, suddenly now you're introducing masks. Um, and so you've got the full PPE, the gloves, aprons, um, and, and masks. And I think those, the, the, the masks in particular, particularly challenging for those that may have dementia, mm. because they rely so much on body language and reading, reading your face and your expressions. And as soon as you take that away from somebody, then it can be a little bit scary as well. So, but we all had to, we had to cope with it, we had to get on. I think it, it, it was a very, very challenging time as, you, as we know for care homes, uh, with care homes and outbreaks of, uh, of COVID. Um, and that had really decimated that whole care home sector. We, I think in, in, in certainly in home care and at home instead, we just totally embraced the, the regulations and the guidelines that we had to follow absolutely stringently and we managed to keep people safe and uh, from our clients perspective and, uh, and our staff and most importantly is keeping the you know that duty of care for our staff as well and keeping them safe um, so i'm just really really uh, grateful and totally impressed with the way that my whole team just rallied together i've never seen team working like it in in supporting each other and keeping our clients and themselves safe and I guess, especially during the height of COVID, keeping people at home was, and preventing them from having to go into hospital yeah. was more important than ever, wasn't it? Well, it was. It was and it was one of those things, I think, Ruben, that we, we, we did see, actually, a decline. Uh, personally, what we saw was actually a, a drop in the number of falls. Now, whether that was... You know, our, our, the conclusion that we came to was that the fact that maybe a lot of our clients, they just weren't getting out. They were being more careful because they did not want to go to hospital. The last thing they wanted was go to hospital because the, the, the number of incidences where people ended up catching COVID in hospital, was, was, uh, that was the, the worst place to be. So people were just trying to be that extra cautious in everything they did. So actually we found the number of falls decline. And interestingly, now we are seeing it go back up again. So it's beginning to rise. So. There's uh, some interesting lessons and studies that are going to come out of that, aren't there? That's good, Mark. That's very insightful. Thank you. Um, I think it'd be good to move on now to more towards the future. Mm -hmm. So um, it'd be very interested to hear what projects, what innovation you're working on here in terms of improving what you do and the care you give going forward. Well, innovation, I think I thrive on. I love, I love being one, trying to be one step ahead and how do we continuously improve? And I think this is a big driver for us, it's not sitting back and thinking, oh yes, we've got an outstanding rating. Um, I think our drive has always been about continuous improvement in everything we do. Um, and that's, that, that's what drives us. Um, so we are constantly looking for uh, new ideas, new processes, what is the future of, uh, of home care? What's the future of care in general? And what are the challenges that, that we are facing? And I think that the, coming out of COVID, coming out of the pandemic, massive problems that the health and social care sector is seeing currently in, in recruitment and staffing. Um, I think there's a lot of industries right across the board where they're all suffering from recruitment issues because a lot of people who were furloughed just haven't gone back to work. Um, they've decided to take time out or go part-time. So the country as a whole has got a, has got a massive problem with uh, over 100 and 50,000 nurses short and over 200,000 carers short. We, we've, and, we, and we have an aging population. So yes, we have a, a problem ahead of us. So I think technology is going to play a role not to replace uh, carers. Technology will undoubtedly, I think going forward, have a tremendous role to place in, in working alongside carers um, and our care professionals. I think there needs to be a lot more integration between health and social care. If we're short of nurses, then how can we, in the home care sector, maybe work alongside the health care sector? Because if I've got a, a care professional visiting somebody in their own home, and we notice that 
they have declined in health and maybe they're, they're, we suspect they've got a temperature, we end up calling it, telling the GP and they've got to get now get a nurse out. Well, why can't my care professional take their temperature, take their um, oxygen levels, do a lot of those vital signs and um, measurements while they're there and with technology, within a couple of minutes, we can have that live, live data straight through to the GP. They haven't got to wait for a doctor or, or a nurse to come out for some of those low level, uh, low level monitoring. So I think there's going to be a ma massive opportunities for, um, for, for some of the good, good care providers with qualified and, and highly motivated and trainable and skilled uh, uh, carers, care professionals to be upskilled in supporting some of those NHS sort of functions. I also think there's going to be a lot of room for additional technologies coming into the home. Home is definitely the place where um, I think I think those innovations will take place rather than going into the, into the care home. Home is where people want to be. So whether it's cameras, whether it's monitors, um, if somebody's had a fall, you've got sensors that can monitor that they've had a fall, real-time fall. Um, it's cameras in the home, it's going to be uh, 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 sensors that can monitor whether a kettle has been switched on so you know that mum's up in the morning and, and got out of bed. Um, uh, even working alongside some of those other technologies that we mentioned about which are medical devices that we could be using to get real-time real -time support back into, into those GPs. In fact, we were working very closely during the pandemic with local GP practices who, um, who, who asked for our services that while we were in visiting um, our, our clients or patients of those medical centers, whether we would be able to take um, use smartphones and, and, and iPads so that they can have real-time consultations with their patients well, we're already visiting them, so we just hooked them up with, with the GP so that they could have a consultation and didn't have to get a GP out. Because the last thing you wanted was another person going in to visit someone at home in the middle of a pandemic. So that worked really, really well. So I see us building on a lot more of those, those sorts of things. Um, I think recruitment, yeah, bringing in the fact that we, we very much now use um, digital devices now, so whether it's for care planning, we, we're not writing paper, paper care plans. Everything's on a digital device, on an iPad, on the smartphone. Uh, medications, so the medication changes that we have for our clients. There's no more waiting until the end of the month for those paper care plans to be read and data collected. It's done real time. So, so as soon as that, that care professional is leaving our client's home, that data is back into our system and we know that they've had their medications or maybe declined to have those medications but it's all done real time. Mm. Yes, that's good. There's a, there's a lot you've, you've put across there. I think that's, that's really good. Um, I think it's really important, isn't it, with um, what you're saying about doing some things that a GP might otherwise have to go and to do. That has system benefits, but also that's much better for the client themselves, isn't it? Because rather than three or four different people coming in, mm. they've got a caregiver, a care professional, from home instead of coming in that comes in anyway. Absolutely. And so it's much better for them, isn't it? Absolutely. I, I think, you know, the, it, there's nothing worse than then you've got to wait for another two or three days for someone else to pop out or, or, or have they then got to go into hospital for those checks when so much can just be done, you know, and particularly from a home instead perspective, if we're visiting them for an hour or an hour or two, having that extra time to be able to deliver those extra services um, has got a massive payback. I know that when, when I've had, a, I had a, a local GP that actually came in and saw me and said, he came into my office and said, Mark, when I look at the patients that you support, he said his estimate that they were two to three times less likely to be readmitted to hospital than he'd seen from any other care provider. And he wanted to delve in further as what we were doing, maybe to, that, that could be the, the, the reason for that. And I think a lot of that, Ruben, is having the extra time and writing really good care plans so that you are looking at what is the outcome that that person wants to achieve. And certainly the homestead model is very much one of focusing on the outcome. 
So we build a care plan based upon the outcome that the person is trying to achieve. When you have very much short visits, 15, 30 minute visits, you end up building a care plan that is based upon tasks because the carer is rushed, so they've got to go in and do tasks rather than focus on the outcome. So if you focus on the outcome, you end up reducing the amount of care they have. And actually, because you've achieved the outcome and got a, 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 a successful outcome, even though the, the model of care might be that the hourly cost might be a little bit more, if you start focusing and then look at what is the medium to long term costs, there are cost savings because you are reducing the probability of them then going into hospital. So therefore, they're saving to the taxpayer, to the government to the NHS, because we're keeping people out of hospital. And if somebody is discharged from hospital, and then they get the wrong care being put in place because they didn't know what medications they, were, they needed, they didn't realize the person coming out had dementia, so you put in a carer that isn't used to dealing with someone with dementia or has Parkinson's because they didn't have a full history of that person's needs, then you can put the, a wrongly trained carer in place that isn't, isn't able to cope with the needs. So then what happens is within two, three, four days, they're back in hospital again. And if they end up going back into hospital within 10 days of a discharge, it's a failed discharge. And then the local authority, the local, not authority, the local uh, healthcare trust gets a fine. So that's more, more cost to the taxpayer. Put in the right care, you keep them out of hospital, keep them out of hospital, everybody wins. The patient wins. Our clients win, um, the NHS, the taxpayer wins, it's a saving. So you might pay a little bit more in the short term, but the medium to long term gains are very, very much. And I think there needs to be a lot more research into what those medium to long term gains are of putting more preventative care in place rather than just reacting and racking the bills up all the time. Yes, absolutely. And it can be very easy in the NHS when there is crisis and there's yeah. pressures to take that very yeah. short-term approach to try and solve problems quickly but actually what you've said just demonstrates about actually taking a long-term view is actually significant savings and it's better for everyone, absolutely i think the other thing is that having with, with that long that long-term approach or the having a, a longer visit with continuity of care so the same carer same care professional visiting on a regular basis allows you to build up trust a trusted relationship and with that trusted relationship and the same person going on a regular basis rather than different carers just turning up every day and not knowing you, you know some some people at home they get these half an hour visits they never see the same person twice well if you haven't got continuity a carer turns up how would you know whether that person's having a good day or a bad day you only get to see them once whereas from the home instead model we're very much having continuity so our care professionals going in know that Betty, Mrs. Smith, she's not on form today. She's having a bit of a bad day or her memory is a little bit, uh, uh, maybe a bit in decline today. It could be the fact that she's got a UTI. So we're able to spot those things, get in touch with a local GP, get some antibiotics, clear up the, G the UTI, and, and we're, we're looking after them. So we're looking after their health and well-being very much, um, uh, much more, and we're monitoring monitoring those changes yeah okay that's good so going back um you spoke a lot about discharges there mark um what have you been doing specifically in terms of making sure they're successful both in terms of the care plan and then actually managing the actual discharge itself yeah good question one of the things that ruben that we had that we'd obviously been following is that uh, a lot of hospitals um are very very keen to discharge their patients particularly on a on a Friday um, they to, to reduce the number of people in over, over over the weekends the problem I think a lot of the hospitals have and the nurses have at the moment I mean it takes hours to go through the discharge procedure at, in a hospital the amount of forms they have to fill in so somebody may be ready to be discharged eight nine o'clock in the morning but eight hours later they're still sitting in a hospital waiting for all the paperwork to be completed to get them out. So we had found that a lot of our, a lot of our clients who were being discharged, particularly say on a Friday, they weren't getting home till eight, nine, ten o'clock at night. 
turning up in a, ho in a house, cold, no food, medications weren't ready for them. So now they need support the next day. The, the home just wasn't ready for them. So come a Monday, Tuesday morning, they can be back in hospital again. So certainly our approach to that was how do we work far closer to that discharge team at the hospital to make sure we get a successful discharge. So when any of our clients are in hospital, one, we go and visit them in hospital. We turn up every day that they needed it and we're there. We're monitoring their progress in hospital. We're keeping good open communications with the discharge team in that ward. So when they are ready to be discharged, we get copies of all that discharge paperwork sent to us. We're able to also, with uh, the client and family's permission, go in. We can keep that, make sure the house is warm. We've got the food in for them. We've got the right medications for them. And if necessary, we're there waiting for them, or we've even gone and picked them up from hospital to bring them home. So they come home. So when they come home, we are ready, knowing exactly what their needs are, that, that, that how those needs may have changed while they've been in hospital. So we've got the appropriate care plan in place from, 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 from go. And as a result of that, and how we've put those, uh, that, um, uh, those, those practices into operation, we get far fewer failed discharges than, uh, than I would say typical, typical of the industry. Yes, that's good. And that's a, a really good example, isn't it, of actually health and social care working much closer together. And I think what you've just said demonstrates the benefit of that, doesn't it? Absolutely. And I think it is about being proactive, thinking you've got to look at what isn't working. And if something isn't working well, then let's cut our heads together and find a way of improving it. Um, rather than just sit back and say, well, that's the way it is. No, it isn't the way it is. It may be the way it is, but it isn't the way it should be. And we've actually got to get ourselves together and say, it doesn't have to be like this. And if, if, the, if there's a problem, be a part of the solution. Don't be part of the problem. That's good. That's good. Um, I know you're very passionate about people having a choice when it comes to care. Um, be very interested for you to say say a bit more about that. Yes, I think you know there's a, there's a wide a wide variety and a wide um, many many different types of care. I think, uh, and that's that's changing perceptions in that is going to be is hard. Um, not everybody delivers the same level of quality. Not everybody works to the same, same processes and procedures or has the same sort of mission and vision. But having choice, I think, is very, very important. Um, I do really, really passionately believe that, that, that educating, I think, the general public, that if, to start looking at, at what options they have, um, whether you're considering a care home or you're considering maybe a bit of support for mum or dad or your husband or your wife or a partner, start thinking about that earlier before it becomes a crisis because most care in this country ends up being put in place because there's a crisis that's happened. And when there's a crisis, you need help now. And when you need help now, you haven't got the luxury, the luxury or the time to then start thinking, well, where do I go? How do I navigate the care system and who's good, who's bad? How, I just need help. Um, and I think that is a, a real struggle for a lot of people. So our, certainly our advice is by going out into the community is getting people to start thinking about this and talking about it. Let's have a national debate. Start thinking about it. If you need care for your mum, dad or whatever tomorrow, where would you go? And what is important to mum or dad? Do they want to stay at home? Do they want to go into a care home, number one? If they want to stay in their own home, then start thinking about what kind of a care provider would they be looking for. Do you want someone that's coming in for 15, 30 minutes? Would you like continuity? Would you like longer visits? Do you want someone to take mum and dad out? Maybe if they're not, they've given up driving. So maybe they're getting depressed. Well, do you want someone coming in who's helping, you know, do you want lots of medication to help them with depression? Or would you, or would you rather have maybe a carer that comes in and takes dad out in the car for a drive, which will actually mean he doesn't need medications because all he wants to do is get out and go for a drive. Um, so these are the kinds of things that we look at where we are, we're very much would, pro would propose 
and be a big proponents of putting in that bit of care earlier. And that little bit of extra support might be a little bit of home help. What is it mum or daddy struggling with? It could be, it could be that, that making the beds. Well, if they're, if they're struggling making the beds and they keep battling on and they keep battling on, they're more inclined, one, they could have a heart attack, a stroke, or it could be they're more inclined to have a fall. But getting that once a week or once every two weeks coming in, doing those sort of works, and then you build up the companionship and trust. Now it could be the shopping. They need a little bit of help with shopping. And certainly our way of working is, and, and, and a real belief, is to do things with our clients rather than put care in place that does it for them. So we will go into somebody's home and provide that little bit of extra support rather than take over in short visits and, and do all the work for them. Those short 30 minute visits, because you're doing tasks for them, what you've done is you've disabled that person because they can't do it for themselves now because you're doing it. Whereas if you've got a carer, a care professional coming in, looking at what is it they're actually struggling with, let's give you a little bit of support and we'll do it together. We'll do it with you rather than for you. And therefore we can keep people living well in their own homes for far longer than I think typically other care providers, which is one of the reasons why. I mean, I remember the, care, the CQC inspector, when we had our last visit, inspection, and we got a fight, we got found to be outstanding in all five areas. We are the only care, home care provider in the southwest of England with an outstanding in all five areas. And the, and the inspector said, so rarely do they ever come across a care provider where the amount of care going in actually decreases. And that was a sign of us actually providing well-led care, we're caring, we're keeping them safe, we were effective, and we were responsive. So in all of those five areas, we got found to be outstanding because we were writing care plans to help them achieve the outcomes that they wanted, and they were achieving those outcomes. So therefore, if they're achieving the outcomes, the amount of care going in decreases. Mm. Yes, that's good. And I think that also has a big difference for the, for the care professionals themselves. You alluded to it earlier about calling them care professionals, not carers. Um, and I think what you said about getting in there and providing that companionship and doing all those other things that wouldn't necessarily be associated with home care, that has a serious benefit in terms of being a care professional as a career, doesn't it? Amazingly so, Ruben. I think you know, 50% of the people that we hire have never worked in care before. Yes, okay. We're not looking for people who've necessarily worked in care before. We, we have an amazing training program, training, induction, learning and development program, because it is about learning and development rather than training. I know a lot of care providers, and uh, I'm not going to name any, but you know, their idea of training is to put, sit you in a room, put you in front of a, a DVD player for one hour, watch this movie on how to wear gloves, aprons, here's your gloves and aprons, away you go. We couldn't be further from that. We have a very, very much comprehensive learning and development program that it, it just starts with a few days, you know, for a week. A week is our initial induction, but it's continuous learning, continuous development, and getting qualifications. Um, but also the recognition um, and, and support that our team gets is, is phenomenal. And it is treating people like true professionals. We want, we want carers to be thought of as in the same way as nurses, but in working in somebody's home. And you've got to give them a training program and the support development and recognition that is on a par with the NHS and the nursing profession. That's good. That's good. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ruben. Absolute pleasure. No, we look forward to a continued relationship with, with Fell Gaines, but also uh, this is a great journey for, for all of us. And, it, and I think the, the other thing is that my vision there is that, you know, we've got an exciting sector we're in. There's going to be some massive changes in, in, in I think, the, the home care sector over the next few years. But it's an exciting, I think, with technologies coming in, with the professionalization Although there's a lot of despondency around about uh, around health and care at the moment, I'm actually really optimistic. 
I think for anybody that wants to be in a really dynamic industry that is going to go through some changes where they can really make a difference to people's lives, this is the industry to be in. Because health and social care is going to, will go through some big changes and we need good, kind, caring people. And with good, kind, caring people in an industry that is ripe for change, the sky's the limit. Absolutely. Wow. Certainly a lot to unpack there. There are many takeaways from that interview, but a couple in particular stand out to me. Firstly, the importance of look at Karen's investment, not a cost, which brings long-term savings and benefits whilst providing better care for the client. And secondly, the importance of the work marketing's team are doing to change perceptions of working in social care, making what they're doing outcome-based, not task-based, and improving it all round. So, that's episode four of Innovators in Care. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time for episode five. Thank you, and goodbye.